original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, the new traditional farming practices, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. In today's show, we're going to talk about Normandy cows. First, I want to go over some of our homestead life updates. Then I'm going to talk about the Normandy cow breed. And today's recipe is creme fraiche. All right, so homesteading life updates. Scott's been out there pruning trees for a couple of days. He's taking a nap right now because it's raining again. Yesterday and the day before were filled with getting the trees in shape. There are 80 plus trees in our small orchard. We have... Apples, peaches, cherries, plums, pears, mulberries, kiwis. There's elderberries and fruit trees. Uh, Those are the fruit trees and bushes. And then we have hazelnut, pecans, and almonds. Those are the nut trees that we have. And uh, he got about 40% complete on the blueberries and blackberries before the rain hit. There are also a few raspberry and grape plants that are kind of in different places around the in the orchard as well. I probably missed one or two in that list, but uh, the orchard is a favorite project for him. It is a lot of work, but he loves it. And we have a beehive back there that's uh, also back there for pollination. So we were at the Withfield Farmers Market this past Saturday and got to meet lots of new people and a shout out and a thanks for your patronage. March 9th is the next market date, and we will have ground lamb and goat, as well as some awesome soup bones. And you get a free recipe card with each purchase. It's going to be a lamb recipe or a goat recipe, depending on what you buy or what you want. You can have either one. Uh, Now, if you buy a whole or a half lamb, you get the all lamb cookbook. And that contains recipes for every cut of lamb in your package. We want to make it easy for you to get the most out of your lamb. And I will admit that the Indian lamb curry is my favorite. It's made from the boneless shoulder roast. Uh, It's cut into bite-sized pieces made with that curry. It's fantastic. Um, And just a little heads up on the March 23rd market, we will have ground beef as well. So we needed uh, more freezer space. So tomorrow we're going to go pick up a freezer that we loaned out last year. Uh, We need it for the beef that we are going to be having soon. I'm a little bummed about the need that drove the event. Um, Sometimes it can be hard to maintain your peace when you have a homestead farm business. Well, here's the story. We have a small herd of Normandy cows. As I mentioned, I'll be talking uh, a great in great detail about that breed today and the purpose of the cows is to provide wonderfully nutritious milk so we can make wonderfully nutritious cheese in order to make that happen the cows need to have a calf every year we milk them for about nine months and uh, then the other three months we do not and they they need that extra energy to uh, grow their calf So, and then with the birth of the calf in the spring, the milking process starts again, and it's a continuous life cycle. Um, You know, in in order to tell the story properly, I need to make a distinction between the cows, the goats, and the sheep. Because the goats and the sheep, they're cute, especially the kids and the lambs, and we watch them play, and we enjoy their beauty. But, and they're not pets, none of our animals are pets. But with the goats and the sheep, we have very little hands-on daily interaction with them. Uh, The goats get their hooves trimmed regularly, and in the spring, we comb out their cashmere. Um, But otherwise, the goats and the sheep pretty much just take care of themselves. And they're there for the goats for fiber, but also for meat. And that is their purpose, and we know that's their purpose. 
And as far as the cattle, we have the milk cows in one herd. And then there's another herd comprised of steers that result from the annual birthing of calves. And we grow them out for beef. And the bull hangs out there as well until we need him. Um, and the steers are pretty, they pretty much take care of themselves as well. I mean, we often watch them grazing peacefully, uh, but we're not physically interacting with them so much. Now, the milk cows are unique. We interact with the milk cows just about on a daily basis. And these cows, cows also, they're not pets, but there is a special relationship or a bond that develops with them. And we pet them and hug them and we talk to them. And cows in general are just very peaceful animals. Um, it's a pleasure to simply watch them graze. One of the reasons I wanted a milk cow was the experience of, of peace that I had had in the past while sitting beside this beautiful creature and performing the action of milking. Um, and we do bond with all of our animals. Um, however, the bond with the milk cows is a little deeper. And the difference is that the other animals are raised specifically for meat as food. But the milk cows are raised for the luscious milk they make. And they get extra special attention. And today, for the first time in my experience on the farm, we had to cull one of our milk cows. She was gentle and calm, as they all are. She had intelligent eyes and a beautiful coat. I'll, I'll talk more about the Normandy coloring in a bit. Um, we put a halter on her and led her onto the trailer. She was only slightly adverse, and, and it didn't take long to get her on the trailer. And when we arrived at the processing facility, she was lying on the floor of the trailer, not seemingly traumatized at all. And once the door was open, she got up, and Scott led her off the trailer. And she got a little antsy at that point when we wanted her to go to an unknown place. But she shortly, shortly, she cooperated. And upon beginning the return journey home, we were both quiet and introspective. It was hard. I think it is the hardest thing I have ever done so far. Now, I've seen the aftermath of a coyote attack on our lambs. I've found dead lambs and goat kids that perished for reasons unknown. Last year, we lost our oldest breeding ewe and her lambs. Likely, it was triplets. Um, she died, died probably just days before she was to give birth. And then this past fall, we called an older ewe that twice had issues birthing her triplets, and we, we didn't want to burden her again. Well, so what happened? Well, Lily was seven years old. She had a calf in 2014 and she had a calf in 2015. And she hasn't had one since. And after more than six or seven months or so with the bull this year, this is back in the fall, when we made the decision, she was still cycling. And we had to let her go. You know, a, a big cow like that is consuming massive amounts of grass and hay and not doing her part to ensure that our small enterprise would continue. You know, and perhaps there were extra steps we could have taken to get her to maybe stand for the bull or maybe she had ovarian cysts and could have been treated by the vet. But that comes with the possibility of a recurrence. And I'm sure I'm going to continue to doubt my decision to color from the herd, but I stand firm <laughs> And that it was a decision that had to be made. I just had no idea it would be so hard. I was in tears that day. And indeed, I'm tearing up a little bit now at the loss of, of this animal. We hold in our mind the purpose of every animal on our homestead. Each contributes to the whole process of sustainability and diversity on our farm. And they must contribute or they must go. At this point, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to get used to losing my milk cows. I can't help but bond with them. And I will cry each time their life with us is over, whatever the reason. I hope this isn't too much of a downer, but I feel it's important to honor her life and to share our feelings as we move forward on the homestead. It's not always roses and butterflies. And I thank you for your patience with me as I grieve just a little. And one way I want to honor her is to share the wonderfulness of her breed and why we chose these cows. So the, the Normandy cow breed. 
It all started because I wanted to drink milk. But I didn't want pasteurized milk. And cheese making has always been a passion of mine since I first learned how to make it back in 1993. And the original pl plan was for one or two cows. You know, we had the sheep. We were doing sheep at that point. So we researched and we researched. We wanted the milk, but also knew that to make that happen, there would be a calf every year. And that means we needed good beef from that calf. Um, and milk cows, just as milk cows, they, they don't, their calves don't put on weight that well, as, as well as a beef cow would. Um, and because our values revolve around living close to and in harmony with nature, we wanted a breed that would do well on pasture without supplemental feed. So we decided on the Normandies. They're, they're a dual breed cow. They produce a lot of milk, but they also produce a good beef cow as well. In fact, in the U.S., most Normandies are grown for beef. Um, so finally, we purchased our first cows in the fall of 2011, and we bought two for milking and one for beef. And I was already enamored with their unique coloring. And as we worked with them, I fell even more in love. I mean, almost all cows have a deeply peaceful quality about them. But this breed takes that quality to the next level. And um, it was a defining moment for us in the evolution of our business aspirations. These cows were to become the centerpiece of our homestead. And so it, we switched from sheep to cows within probably a year, less than two years, we decided, nope, we're going to do cheese. So let me talk a little bit about this cow. As the name implies, the breed comes from Normandy, a northwestern region of France. And since Normandy is famous for its Viking influence, many people believe that the breed actually descended from the cattle that the Vikings imported when they came um, to that area of France. Um, so for over a thousand years, these cattle evolved into a dual purpose breed to meet the milk and meat needs of the residents of northwestern France. Now, during the Allied invasion of Normandy, beginning June 6, 1944, through sometime in July 1944, the breed was nearly wiped out. But today, they are alive and well. And as of five years ago, there were about three million Normandy cattle grazing on French pastures with large numbers in the regions of Normandy, Brittany, and Maine, as well as, as, as in the Ardennes and Pyrenees. Although popular for their beef in France, they are primarily milk producers. Now, let me talk about their colors. Have I mentioned that these are gorgeous cows. They have distinctive eye patches. Um, there are, uh, and then there are three characteristics of their coat colors, sometimes referred to as the three Bs. You have blanc, which is white, blonde, which is actually a fawn or a red color, and then brindled, which is a darker brown. It's kind of hard to describe, so I'll put pictures in the post on the website. Please check them out. I believe I mentioned they are gorgeous. So the arrangement of the colors are also really varied. Blanc is the white. So it's it's mostly white. Sometimes it's called quail. Um, the coat is kind of scattered with very small patches of color. And then the blonde coat, is it has one big fawn or red patch covering almost the entire cow's body. And then the belly and the head are white. And then they have the circles around the eyes. Um, the circles around the eyes of all of these coats that I'm describing, they always have the circles around the eyes. Well, not always, but like probably 99% of the time. Now, the brindle is going to be similar to the blonde, but the, but the patch of that's covering most of the body is a dark brown, even, even to black. Now, Normandy uh, cows are now available around the world. The breed has been export, exported to many different countries and it has thrived in all of them. They adapt well to a wide range of climates um, in South America, Central Europe, Western Europe, Asia, and North America. The breed has shown its versatility. And while having been exported worldwide, 
uh, they actually received their greatest acceptance right now in South America. And they were introduced there in the 1890s. The total number there now exceeds 4 million purebred plus countless Normandy crossbreeds. In Colombia alone, they have 1.6 million purebreds. Uh, And the rest of them are mainly in Brazil, Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay. Now, they're also uh, growing in number in countries such as here in the U.S., Mexico, Madagascar, um, Belgium, Switzerland, Great Britain, Ireland. So they're pretty versatile around the world. Now, let me talk a little bit about their milk and the cheese. So the milk is about 3.5% protein, 4.4% fat with a 4.2% butterfat content. That probably won't mean much to you right now, but we'll talk about that later as well when we talk about making cheese. And the reason their milk is so suitable for cheese making is because of high levels of beta casein and kappa casein. And we'll get into that also more at a later date. Um, That's what makes the, you have to have really good milk to make really good cheese. And in France, the Normandy is associated with the production of famous cheeses such as Camembert de Normandy, Levereau, and Pont Levesque. Those are all uh, like a moist, soft, creamy, surface ripened cheese. Um, there are other cheeses, but those, those are made from Normandy milk, Normandy cow's milk. In France, to legally carry the official name, the cheese must meet certain requirements for manufacturing location, the type of cow, whether it's raw and or pasteurized milk is allowed, and the specific processes. And the official Camembert de Normandy is made entirely from raw milk from the Normandy breed grazed in the Normandy region of northwestern France. And then there are some also requirements for, it has to be raw milk and the process is is regulated as well. So like I said, there are lots and lots of other cheeses from the Normandy region of France, but the three I mentioned require, require the use of milk from the actual Normandy breed of cow. There are a couple of other popular breeds of cow in, uh, in France. So Normandies are a sustainable breed for sustainable agriculture. Um, Since the Normandy cattle have been raised on grass only for many centuries, their um, grazing ability is highly commended. You got long, damp, cold, muddy French winters, and there were simple forage diets. It has prepared the Normandies for the worst. And as I mentioned today, Normandies have spread from the Andes to the tropical coastlines of South America, to Ireland, to Canada. And because the Normandy has not been selected solely on one character, it has retained exceptional qualities that are often lost by specialized breeding. This is one of the advantages of, of, of tradition. So highly desirable qualities such as fertility and calving ease, excellent feet and legs, overall hardiness, they're all prominent. They have a thick curly winter hair that ensures a good protection against the cold and boy did they need that this year. The eye rings are effective against the sun in the summer. And also, this particular breed also shows remarkable docility, and that makes the handling of bulls very easy. Though you always watch your back with bulls, but but we had one that just, he was so huge though, he scared me. (laughs) But he was gentle. He was always gentle. And finally, raised on grass for centuries, the Normandy shows outstanding grazing ability and that works for us. So that's it for your overview of this excellent breed of cow. I hope you've enjoyed this little trip through French history and learning new information is always a joy for me and I hope you were entertained as well. Well, Let's talk about creme fraiche. Creme fraiche. I'm going to spell that for you and uh, it is C-R-E-M-E-F-R-A-I-C-H-E. But it is pronounced creme fraiche. It's similar to sour cream. And while sour cream and creme fraiche are both used to add richness and a tangy flavor, they are not the same thing. So is it worth taking the extra time to make your own creme fraiche? I am going to say absolutely yes, depending on the use. 
but absolutely yes. So how are they made? Now, sour cream is made by adding a lactic acid culture to heavy cream, uh, sometimes milk, to thicken and to sour it. In France, creme fraiche was traditionally made from unpasteurized cream that naturally contained the right bacteria to thicken it. Now, since our cream is pasteurized here in the U.S., creme fraiche is now made by adding a fermenting agent with bacteria to heavy cream. So today's recipe will be the Americanized version of creme fraiche. Now, what is the difference between sour cream and creme fraiche? Uh, sour cream has a fat content of about 20% and may include ingredients like gelatin, renin, and vegetable enzymes to stabilize it and make it thicker. Creme fraiche has a fat content of about 30% and does not contain any added thickeners. Creme fraiche is thicker, has a richer flavor, and is less tangy than sour cream. You would use it anywhere that you would use sour cream. But because sour cream has less fat but more protein, simmering or boiling it will result in curdling. So creme fraiche is a better choice for sauces or soups. If you're using it in a salad or as a topping, they're pretty much interchangeable. The choice is yours. Some people like the tanginess of sour cream, while others like the richness of the creme fraiche. All right, what do you need? Simple. You need two cups of heavy cream and three tablespoons of cultured butter, buttermilk. Make sure it's got active culture in it. Again, because we're using pasteurized milk, we have to add those cultures. So what do we do? In a glass jar, you're going to combine the buttermilk with the heavy cream. Three tablespoons of buttermilk into the heavy cream. Cover the jar tightly with a cheesecloth or some other breathable material. And then you're going to let it sit at room temperature, 70 to 75 degrees for 24 hours. All right. Take the cloth off. Stir it. It's going to be thick, but it will, it's going to get a little thicker too. So you take the cloth off, put a lid on it, and refrigerate it for another 24 hours before using it. Is that simple or what? Buttermilk into the cream, set it out on the counter 24 hours, set it in the fridge 24 hours. All right, enjoy. Now for our final thoughts here. That's going to be it for the next uh, for this episode of Peaceful Heart Farmcast. And uh, so work is continuing on all sorts of farm products. There's still more to do in the orchard. The garden is going to be picking up soon. That always adds a bit of hurried activity in the spring. But we are looking forward to it. And I hope you enjoy the trip down memory lane and through Normandy, France. We plan to visit one winter when we're not milking our beautiful and gentle cows. In the meantime, visit us at PeacefulHeartFarm.com forward slash recipes and download that creme fraiche recipe it's so fun and satisfying to make things with your own two hands and in this case so easy as always i'm here to help you taste the traditional touch thank you so much for listening and until next time may god fill your life with grace and peace <music>